So, good morning, and welcome to everyone as we're worshiping God today. If you happen to be visiting with us, and we are delighted that we have had some visitors in the last few weeks, or if you've been invited by a member of our church to come and to join with us for Sunday morning worship, which we hope that everyone will, will do that, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, also, thank you to everyone for signing in as you come in, just in case we would need to do contact tracing. This is the time of year when the clocks change, and if any of you showed up an hour early for church, is anyone brave enough to admit that? Okay, good, we all got our clocks right. You could consider that a spiritual discipline as you sit out in the parking lot for an hour. This is also the time when we start having announcements for Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving food baskets, and Advent, which starts on November 28th, and we're gonna have a worship series on Shalom, and Christmas, so Thanksgiving, Advent, and Christmas. And the Women's Guild uh, raffle will be happening. We will hear a little bit about that. We also want to encourage everyone to please get your pledge cards in so that we'll have a most up-to-date info for our budget for next Sunday's annual congregational meeting. Next Sunday, we're gonna be receiving new members in worship, which is wonderful. We'll be sharing at our Lord's table for communion. And so it's a big day to be sure. Uh, also, the liturgical color for this season up until Advent begins is green. And there are liturgical reasons for that, but in our part of the world, it also, I'm sure, represents the Green Bay Packers. And I'm gonna to continue to wear my red tie. See? As long as the uh, UW Badgers continue to show up like they did yesterday against Rutgers. Of course, uh, 52 to three may have upset some of our many New Jersey friends and my former church members. And that makes me so very, very sad. <coughs> right. <laughs> Friends, we have a very special announcement Judy Scoopian is gonna share with us. Good morning. I hope you all are as excited about the raffle this year that we, as the Guild Ladies are, we decided that um, due to the circumstances of COVID that we at least could do a partial raffle. The meal will not be held for you know, various, or one main, main reason, safety, but we decided that we could do the raffle. So starting today, you've probably seen in the newsletters and the bulletin before that we are gonna start selling raffle tickets and I've already sold some this morning. Um, <clears throat> there are six for $5 or $1 for one ticket. And um, you, we are going to have this just an in-house raffle. Uh, so yeah, you're more than welcome to um, sell tickets to your family and friends, but we are gonna, it's gonna be a smaller group this year. You're all, we're also asking for everybody who wants to take part in this to, um, we, we are accepting uh, prizes. Um, now's a good time to mention that uh, Kelly and Lisa are still doing those script cards and Kelly will be in the back along with us selling raffle tickets this morning and you can um, look through the book. She said she has a good supply of a variety of uh, script, uh, different um, businesses that you can buy tickets from and perhaps use that as a gift or we take cash prizes or any kind of a prize. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I think I've covered everything. So uh, we will be selling um, every Sunday until the raffle. Oh, I should mention that the raffle, instead of being on a Saturday, is going to be the first Sunday in December, which I think is the 4th or the 5th. I'm not sure. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it'll be held right after church, that way you don't have to run in twice. And uh, we look forward to having another su successful raffle. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Judy. 
Friends, are there any other uh, announcements or any other uh, special uh, celebrations that we'd like to share? Then, friends, let us uh, be found in worship before God, and as we are able, let us stand and share in our responsive call to worship. What joy it is to be in worship together. For wherever we are, God draws us near to each other in faith. We come from very busy lives, filled with both joys and difficulties. Welcome to this time, an awareness that God will ease your burdens and celebrate your joys with you. We seek to discover hope and peace and purpose in our living. Whatever has happened this week in your life, know that God is with you and offering you peace, renewal, and blessing. Thank you, God, for accepting us as we are and for helping us to be thankful for this community of faith in which we are loved, we are supported, and we are welcomed always. Let us worship our God. Please be seated, and as the hymn is played, please consider the words of our opening hymn, The Church of Christ in Every Age. For our prayer of confession, as we are able, let us stand and share together. As we open our hearts to receive God's word and spirit, may we find healing and comfort, service and joy that will then extend beyond us to bring God's shalom, God's peace to our community and world. So let us pray together in one voice. Gracious God, so often when we look at ourselves as individuals and as a congregation, we think that we cannot really make a difference. We may believe that only those with extraordinary abilities or rock solid faith can truly serve you or inspire others to commit themselves to you. So in looking with such limited vision, we may miss opportunities near and far. How foolish we are, Lord, to decide beforehand what you can or cannot accomplish through us. Help us to look to each day with expectation and to listen for your healing and strengthening words. Make whatever we commit to serve you, no matter how small in our own eyes, to become a wellspring of hope and care for others. Help us to bring our lives, just as they are, to you, to receive your gracious love and to accept your guiding hope. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let us take a moment of silence to center ourselves and to make our own personal prayers before God. Friends, God has blessed each one of us with unique talents and a hope 
that will not fail us. With joy, we bring our lives, our talents, our hopes, and our dreams as gifts to God. We are blessed by God's absolute love for us. We rejoice in that love, and in it we find healing and purpose. Amen. Please be seated. The time when we as a church are united in prayer is a great privilege because our hearts are united, our prayers are lifted before God, and we are embraced in God's spirit. And so let us be in an attitude of prayer and conclude sharing our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, you have placed before us your wonderful world with its blessings and also with its difficulties. You have called us to be people of peace, people who will work for you, offering our lives and our talents and our perspectives and our gifts and our understanding, all in your service. But sometimes, O oh Lord, we do hold back from trusting in all these gifts you have given to us. We wonder if there will be enough to make a difference. And we become caught in a trap believing that only the largest talents and the boldest personalities and the most public of gestures and the most applauded of actions truly have worth. So forgive us when we slide so easily into our own anxieties of being inadequate. For each one of us has been blessed. Each one of us is called to be a blessing there are no small or insignificant ways in which you move us to bless others and to use our faithfulness as a witness to your presence and love. So free us from our fears of not being enough or not having enough and help us to joyfully place our hopes and dreams and our lives in your care. O oh God, our prayers are truly one of the ways that we do make things change. And now in the silence of our hearts, in the prayers that we share with each other, we lift up situations today throughout the world, in our nation, in, in our own community, in our individual hearts, in our families, in our church. We seek your restoring mercies we ask for your comforting power to help us to feel that those same mercies and energies active in our lives will remind us that your love is being poured out on all people and through us to all people. Holy God, we pray that in this time of worship, in our lives going forward, that you will continue to strengthen us and to encourage us to move forward in ministry that we do together, that we'll seek to be faithful in ways whenever we hear your voice calling us to follow. For we ask all these things this day and always in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to pray together this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in these last few weeks before we begin the season of Advent, the beginning of the Christian liturgical year, we continue and we conclude our journey through the Gospel of Mark. 
which has been a fascinating journey as we've continued to see how rapid fire things are just all the time in Mark. Uh, it's, it's energized. He uses the word immediately all the time. But now we're at Passover week. It's the last week of Jesus' active ministry and his life before the crucifixion and the resurrection. Jesus is continuing to teach his disciples. And so this is his last teaching before he's arrested. He's in the temple. These are familiar words, but let us listen with fresh ears. As Jesus was teaching his disciples, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in their long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and he said to them, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. May God bless to us this reading from God's word in the Gospel of Mark. This is a rather familiar passage. It's one that even has a name that tends to resonate with everyone, the widow's might. It often gets pulled out, to be honest, at stewardship campaign time, but we're past that. It's a familiar incident. This also occurs in the Gospel of Luke, with a poor widow, we're told, who comes to put in her last two coins, small coins, her, into the collection pot in the temple. Now, this passage is often interpreted and often you know, misused as an uncomfortable stewardship sermon by many preachers, suggesting that true faithfulness means giving all of your financial wealth to the church. Now, preachers can also do the same thing with the rich young man passage and other texts that mention money or wealth or possessions and so on. And there are many of them, to be, to be sure. Fully one out of every six of Jesus' sayings and teachings has something to do with possessions or with money. And so it was an important topic for Jesus. But, but let's dig into this little passage for just a moment. I think we suffer from what I sometimes refer to as the curse of the full color Sunday school lithograph. How many of you grew up with those full color pictures that every church seemed to have that were tacked up or pasted up onto the wall? I, I remember them vividly from being a small child. And there were these idealized pictures of a very clean and neat, neat looking Jesus, strangely enough, often with blonde hair and blue eyes, no, <laughs> and with a clean whitish robe. And in this case, he's pointing toward a humble but very nicely attired widow in the temple. So there's no road dust in those pictures. There's no holes or tatters in those robes. And yet, a widow such as this woman would have actually appeared very, very differently. She only had two temple coins, 
because you had to change Roman coins into temple coins. And they only were told equaled in the Greek a, a lepton. And a lepton was the smallest of any Roman coin. Now she's out here in the court of the women portion of the temple complex because women and Gentile converts and foreigners were not allowed to enter the inner court of the temple. And so in that sense, she's already pushed out. And she's putting in these coins into 13 huge metal pots shaped like, like, like this and very big so that when you put money into them, they would clang for everyone to hear. And some people intentionally made a very loud noise, a very loud clanging when they put in lots of coins. They loved the attention. Sometimes the amount that very wealthy people gave was even announced out loud to everyone in the courtyard. But her two last coins were equal to six minutes wages of an average day laborer. In our today's money, that would be about maybe 50 cents. And if that's all that she had left, then she's obviously not been taken in by her husband's family upon the death of her husband. That was the general custom, but it wasn't required. And so she's by herself. She has no social standing. She's at the very bottom rung of the cultural ladder. She's alone and she's forced to fend for herself. There was no social safety net in those days. Her last two coins. It's little wonder then that all, all of the prophets, you've been studying the prophets in the class on Sunday morning, all of the prophets placed the care of widows very, very centrally in their list of things that a just culture should do. And those who turned away the widows, they were profoundly condemned by the prophets as being those who spoke words eloquently of their religion, but they lived without faith in real time. There's a wonderful Episcopal priest, Barbara Brown Taylor, who was a very significant theologian of our times, of what really matters in our culture. And she reflects on this passage. She says, nowhere in this passage does Jesus praise the widow for what she's doing. He simply calls his disciples to notice her and to compare what she does with what everyone else is doing. He invites them to sit down beside him and to contemplate the disparity between the, the abundance and the poverty, between the large sums and two copper coins, between apparent sacrifice and the real thing. He does not dismiss the gifts of the rich. He simply points out that the major characters are the minor givers, while the minor character, the poor widow, turns out to be the major donor of them all. The teachings of Jesus, the last teaching of Jesus. What we can assume about this poor widow is that she is not being forced to give those coins, for, except for Jesus pointing her out to his disciples, she would have been virtually unnoticed, a nobody in cultural eyes. And even so, she chooses to commit, as the original Greek text says, her whole life, not her whole living, but to commit her whole life, literally. And as I said, this is the last public teaching of Jesus because next he is arrested, he's abused, he's crucified, and he dies. And no doubt, later on, Jesus' disciples will finally make the connection between Jesus and this woman, giving absolutely all 
that each one of them has while the world keeps passing by. There's a story of another widow in the Bible that often comes to mind when we think about this. It's the story of Ruth from the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. And it does much the same thing. By showing the devotion of a Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth, for Naomi, the widowed mother of her deceased husband. And so it's a story not just about a widow, but about two widows in the one story. Why are widows so singled out in these stories? Because in the symbolic language of the Hebrew people, a widow was as vulnerable and helpless a person as there could be in that time, in that culture. For without a husband, since only men could own property in those days, all the property, so without a husband, a woman was without a home, and the deceased husband's family often did, but had no responsibility to take her in. And if she didn't have family to take her back in, then she would have to fend for herself. She would probably starve, get sick, and perish. And then to be poor to begin with in that culture was to be viewed by many as being cursed by God. A lot of people thought, particularly the people who were the teachers and the rich, would teach that, well, if you were poor or you were sick, you were obviously, for some reason, you or your ancestor were being cursed by God. You somehow deserved this fate. What a cruel culture. And, and what of Ruth, the Moabite? Let's not forget how important Ruth, a widow, turned out to be. Now, Ruth was both a widow and was a woman of the country of Moab. She was a foreigner to the Hebrew people. She was a woman who was about as outside the loop as you possibly could get. But she was young and she was healthy and she was given leave by her mother-in-law, Naomi, to return back to Moab, to her own country, to her own people, so she could start over, so she could survive. But instead, Ruth chooses to devote herself out of love to her mother-in-law, even, even if it meant poverty, starvation, and death. You remember those wonderful words of the story of Ruth? Entreat me not to leave thee. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. This is devotion of love that goes so far beyond sacrifice, beyond self-interest, even beyond self-preservation. Love simply for the sake of love. The Hebrew people had a word for love like this. It's how they described God's love, the divine pathos. They called it chesed. And in the Greek New Testament scriptures, there's a word for the same thing. This, this depthless love, this divine love called agape or agape. Now you may not have the entire story of Ruth from the Hebrew scriptures memorized. Does anyone? If you do, come up here and recite it. Okay, no, not all of us have it. But let me refresh your memory about a few details about the story of Ruth. Now when her relative, Boaz, publicly proclaims in the marketplace to witnesses that he is choosing to take responsibility for Ruth, the relative of his kinsman, to receive her into his household, to take her as his wife. He is blessed by all those around him. And this is some of what they said. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house to be like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrata and bestow a name in Bethlehem. Where have we heard those words before? 
And later in the story, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and she became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. And Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. Ah, as they say, the plot thickens. So the faithful woman, Ruth, the widow, a woman from outside the Hebrews, became the direct ancestor, the great-grandmother of King David, a family that was nurtured in Bethlehem, Ephratah. And who was the descendant of King David that also was born in Bethlehem, Ephratah? Right, his name was Jesus. And so Ruth, this outsider, this widow, this Moabite, this foreigner, out of her devotion of love to Naomi, became the direct ancestor of Jesus because of the faithfulness of a widow, Ruth, Jesus came to be. So for both Ruth, for this woman in the temple, their society didn't allow women to have power or to speak out for themselves or to be boisterous or arrogant. They had to conduct themselves quietly but how their quiet boldness comes through. The boldness of a temple widow to give everything, to give her whole life, everything that sustained her, to give that as an offering to God out of faith. The boldness of Ruth to choose an uncertain future and to enter the threshing room where women did not go. These women may have moved quietly, but they were not. They were not sheep. They had a deep knowledge of who they were in God's eyes. And they acted on that conviction. Two women, Ruth and the woman with the two coins. Two widows considered powerless, considered humbled to the ground by life. They have become two of the best known women in the history of the world. An example that inspires and challenges us to ask, what is it that we really believe? And to what does that belief commit us to do and to be? There's a pastor named Reverend Bob Olmsted who spoke of a seminary professor who made major contributions to scholarly and ecclesiastical life. He went on a seminary retreat that was being led by this professor. And at the retreat, he says, people went around the circle and they told why they were there. They told what factors had, had impelled them toward a life of service in the church. And he describes one participant. When we got to him, he said that he was there because of Miss Willa Brown. Now, who was Miss Willa Brown? Was she, was she a distinguished preacher? Was she a wise teacher? And he said, no, Miss Willa Brown was the, the little old lady who always sat alone near us on the pew on Sunday morning. And during the service, when I had settled in with my parents for that long, boring sermon, 
Miss Brown would secretly smile at me and pull out a piece of the best tasting chocolate in the history of the world. She always had it just for me. And each Sunday, that was the most tangible, visible, sacramental expression of disinterested, unreturnable love I have ever experienced. I am here today serving in the church because of Miss Willa Brown. You know, when we talk about the widow's might, we're not talking about might, M-I-T-E, something tiny. No, we're talking about might, M-I-G-H-T, strength, holy love, a real power in a world that's shallow and transient so often in its values. And with such love comes hope, and with such hope comes faith. When you think about it, we almost know nothing about the widow Jesus pointed out in the temple. And Jesus doesn't interact with her, and it seems like we hear no more of her, or do we? Is not this story about the, the widow and her two coins, the widow's might, isn't that one of the best known stories of a woman in the Bible? Doesn't the term, the widow's might, immediately create an image of us even if we don't know her name? Isn't she the very archetype of giving out of the deepest places of your heart, of all that we have, to the, to the work and worship and service of God? Yes, this poor widow of first century Palestine is long past and yet her act has become a symbol and an inspiration for all time and for all time to come. This widow's might is a might as in strength because she knew who she was as a child of God and she knew who God was. And such persons as this make a difference in our world. They make a difference in our faith, often without ever intending to be such an example or an inspiration. In the 20th century, there was a French Jesuit priest and one of the most reflective thinkers of all time named Teilhard de Chardin. And he once said that the greatest evil in the world is the refusal to use the power for good that God has put within us. And if that's true, then we're really not in a position to judge others who don't know God and therefore don't know who they're called to be. But we are in a position to critique ourselves because we do know who we are. Scripture tells us, and we know who God is, and thus who we are. And what does Scripture tell us about us? What does Scripture tell us about us? Well, I'll give you a quick run through. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we are called the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In the Gospel of John, we are the fruit connected to Christ who is the vine. In Acts, we're people of the way. In Romans, we're joint heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance. In Corinthians, in Corinthians, we're a temple, a dwelling place for God. In Galatians, we are sons and daughters of God because we're one in Christ. In Ephesians, we are saints, fellow citizens with the rest of God's family. In Philippians, we're citizens of heaven, seated in heaven even now. In Colossians, we're hidden in God with Christ. In Thessalonians, we are the chosen of God, holy and dearly loved. In Timothy, we're those who have been given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. In Titus, we're those who have been set apart according to God's plan. In Philemon, we are soldiers. In Hebrews, we are those who have been purified by the offering of our great high priest, Jesus. 
In James, we are brothers and sisters. In Peter, we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. In the epistles of John, we're the children of Christ who resemble Christ when he returns. In Jude, we are those who are called and beloved in God. And finally, in Revelation, we're those whose names are written in the book of life. This same pastor, Bob Olmsted, once spoke about a certain man in his church who served God by teaching Sunday school for years. He taught the boys' fourth grade class. Oh, bless him. There were only two or four boys in the class, but every week he was there teaching those boys in Sunday school. And as part of his work, his everyday job, he traveled a lot, but he always cut his travel short to be home on Sunday in order to teach that class. And the man's actions really defined the word faithful. He was so steady. But ironically, his job picture changed at one point, and he found himself looking for a job and interviewing, and he was turned down. And after the interview, he appealed to just know why he had not measured up, why he was turned down for the job. And he was told, well, your resume is frivolous. He said, frivolous? And so he asked even more, and the interviewer finally told him that because he listed Sunday school teaching as an asset, it was considered frivolous, and he was rejected. In our disposable throwaway culture, in a world that gladly reduces human beings to, to numbers and digits, the church stands as one of the few places that still believes that inspiration is not something that happens to you, but rather inspiration is something that you are called to enact upon the world for no other reason that you are here and you know who you are and you are one of God's loving creation. So friends, as we consider these widows in the text today, let's make a commitment. Not a commitment of finances, because to be, to be candid, people don't support churches financially because they're guilty or duty-bound or because of slick campaigns. People support their church financially if they feel that they are part of the church, that they are the church. But let our commitment be one that's even broader and deeper. Let a commitment of ourselves, our whole selves, to being people of God that we're called to be. Discipleship doesn't mean to, to act like saints, but it means to accept the calling to be saints of God and the world, to live in forgiving and giving ways to love others as God loves you. To approach others first on the basis of the creation of God that they are. And to seek ever deeper ways to learn who we are. And to learn who God is to us. That's an investment in might that changes the world. This, for Ruth, and for a first century widow, was truly the widow's might. And it is our might, our strength to claim as well, if we will. Amen. Friends, as we have our closing hymn, let us listen to the tune, but also take to heart the words where charity and love prevail.
So friends, let us go forth now into the world. Let us be for one another as Ruth and Naomi were for each other. Let us be as the inspiration of one who gave her whole life to God. Let us go on the journey together, wherever it may lead us, wherever God may call us. And so share the gifts of God with the people of God. Be, be gentle, but be bold. Be courageous, be trusting. For God will be with us this day and every day. Amen. Thank you.